Sometimes go to an awesome conference, you've served many people, you've given of yourself, and you come in a little sluggish. But I felt that that, that that song got us going a little bit right there, and maybe got our hearts prepared to be able to hear a message entitled, Nothing is Impossible. Let's turn to Luke chapter 1. Here we find the account of the angel coming to Mary. Verse 26. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. You know, right here we find a very powerful account of Gabriel's coming to Mary and sharing with her God's plan and purposes, not just for her life, but for the entire world, for all generations. It's interesting to note that earlier in chapter 1, Luke builds his gospel, we understand through the Holy Spirit, but through eyewitness accounts. And so, why does Luke have such detail here between Mary and the angel? Because Mary shared this account with him. Secondly, we need to understand that Mary most likely at this time was probably 14 or 15, at the most probably 16 years old. Tradition holds it that that she was an orphan. And very interestingly, we find that the angel comes to her, and the angel just simply says, Greetings, you who are highly favored, the Lord is with you. Now, you get that kind of a compliment from an angel, you know something's going to be asked of you real soon. <laughs> and isn't he surprised? Then in verse 29, it says, And Mary was greatly troubled and wondered what kind of greeting it was being. And then he shares the plan of salvation for all generations that Mary would be overshadowed by God through his Holy Spirit. She'd be impregnated and would give birth to a son in his name would be called Jesus. As a testimony that God could do the impossible. He says, even Elizabeth, in her old age, is going to have a child, and she was said to be barren, is in her sixth month, and he says, nothing is impossible with God. Once the angel shares that account, once the angel states the fact that nothing's impossible with God, then we see the heart of Mary. I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. If there's one word that sums up this woman's heart, it's surrender. She is totally trusting, but totally surrendered to the will of God. You know, that's the challenge we have. If we're really going to believe, nothing is impossible. Our first point is this. Surrender to God's purposes and timing. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Let's get us a running start in verse 15. Paul admonishes the church there at Ephesus. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, 
may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance of the saints, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the work of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. And the church said, Amen. right here, Paul says, I'm praying for you, church at Ephesus, all the time. He says, my prayer is simple. He says, I pray that the eyes of your heart will be enlightened, that you'll be able to see What's he asked to see? That God has this incomparably great power at work in our lives. You know, when you become a disciple, when you become a Christian, after you come up from the waters of baptism, you receive not only the forgiveness of sins, which gives you a relationship with God, but you receive his Holy Spirit, which gives you the power to live the Christian life. Now, the word power in the Greek is dynamus. It's where we get the English word dynamite. And you talk about the power of God, the dynamite of God, that's the Holy Spirit. And he can blow any sin out of your life. Amen, church? But here's the power. And I, I think for a lot of Christians, they get to the point, I don't know if I can change this. I don't know if I can overcome this. He says, listen, the power you have in Christ through the Holy Spirit is the same power, the same dynamite that raised Jesus from the dead. Now, that's a lot of power. You with me right here? And last time we checked the medical books, raising someone from the dead was impossible. You can change anything in your life because nothing is impossible with God. Now, that being said, Paul goes on in verse 22 and he says that God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Now, a quick perusal of this scripture might lead you to go astray a bit. A lot of people, when they first read this scripture, say, oh, that's exactly what Paul taught in Colossians 1.18, that Christ is the head of the church, his body. Well, that's a true statement, amen. But that's not what this scripture is teaching. This scripture says, God's placed everything under his feet. Now, Paul's making a strong point right here. Everything in the world is under the authority of Jesus Christ. How much under the authority of Jesus Christ is it? It's even under his feet. And it says, why? So he can be head over everything for the church. Jesus' power, his power, Authority is to benefit the church. In the first century, Paul says in Colossians 1.23 that every creature under heaven had heard proclaimed to them the gospel of Jesus Christ. And from that, we get that the world was evangelized in that generation. Now, it was really, though, a very important part of that was the timing of God. When Mary was alive was during what was called a period of history called the Pax Romana, which means the Roman peace. It was a time when Rome controlled so much of the world that it was very easy to go from one country to another country to another country. Why? Because Rome was the one empire. And so the Christians could easily go into all the world Preaching the gospel. That was the timing of God. Are you with me right here? You know, back in 1979, when our former movement began, was during the Pax Americana. The American peace. Where having an American passport allowed you to get into almost every country of the world. It was incredible. But not only was God working in that way, but he was working with whole countries to prepare their hearts for the gospel. 
I remember in 1986, we were getting the team ready to go to Johannesburg, South Africa. And advice came, oh, you need to send two churches there, one a black church and one a white church, because apartheid is the law of the land. And they said, well, you got to obey the laws of the land. I said, no, you don't. So you got to obey God rather than men. And so we sent one team, half white, half black. Just a few months after that, apartheid was struck down as a law in Johannesburg, South Africa. See, God was moving. And it's so awesome to have Sasha and Louisa right here in the front row. Elaine and I took a mission team to Moscow, Russia back in July of 1991. Sasha was the number three baptism. And his girlfriend at that time, Louisa, was the number four baptism. And just about a month after they were baptized, the coup came. Now, you got to remember, when we went there, it was the Soviet Union. After the coup came, there was religious freedom. There was democracy to a degree. And the Soviet Union began to break up in other nations, and which allowed there to be such an openness of heart that the very first year we were there, 850 people were baptized in Moscow. Is that incredible? See, it was the timing and the purposes of God. Even going into China, Britain and China had had a war called the Opium War, and they made a treaty that came due in 1997, where Hong Kong would be ceded back from Great Britain to China. And so we saw that as an opportunity for us, and so we built a mission team that we sent into Hong Kong in 1987, so that in 10 years' time, it would be engulfed in the belly of the dragon. Amen, guys? And see, all these things were set up by God for that time and that place. And so we understand the Pax Romana, amen. We understand the Pax Americana, but how about the new movement? What, what's, what's God doing now? I call this time the Pax Obama. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's an incredible time. I mean, you look, in the olden days, we built mission teams. We had to send one to Italy because you, you couldn't be anything but Italian going there. We had to build a separate one to France. We had to build a separate one to um, places like Germany. Now, the EU has made it simple. You can be any member of the European Union nations, and you can go to any one of those nations with the gospel. We already have a remnant group there in London. I mean, it's incredible. We just take that remnant group and spread out throughout all those nations. I mean, that is how easy it is. Obama, with having a Muslim descent, I mean, he's really, I think, kind of a Nebuchadnezzar of this hour. God has raised him on up. There's no more powerful man in all the face of the earth. And he's, and you're never going to pacify the fundamentalist Muslim, but don't kid yourself. There has been a backing off and accepting by a lot of the Muslims around the world because Obama is our president. Forget whether you're for him or against him. Understand God made him president. And this hour is here, I believe, because one of the areas we most had trouble evangelizing was the Middle East. And now here it is, the Pax Obama, and the new movement has started, and we're going to go to the Middle East. Amen, guys? <laughs> See, we need to have this kind of faith that everything is under the feet of Jesus. You know, not only is God working throughout the globe and through the nations, but he's working through individuals to evangelize the nations. And there's no question that last Sunday, with the appointment of Michael and Michelle to be evangelist and women's ministry leader, was an historic point in our movement. Amen? And, I mean, when you, when you think about their lives, you say, wow, it is totally God. I mean, here it is. Michael was born in 1973. Born in the Portland, Oregon area. And yet he had a very tough time. After a few years... His mom went through a divorce, and they were left to grow up in a studio apartment, his mother, him, and his three brothers. After a while, when he was in high school, his mom was arrested and put in prison for drugs, and Mike was left to raise his three brothers. A lot of people know that Michael's an outstanding athlete. What they don't know is he's also an outstanding student. I don't know why they don't know that, Michael. (laughs) 
And Michael received two scholarships, one to the University of Oregon in Eugene and one to the University of Washington in Seattle. He turned them both down in order to stay and raise his brothers. Is that intense? Well, after a while, he started to get into acting. And the acting world is extremely sinful and full of all sorts of sin. And, and Michael was pulled into all of that. But sometimes you have to be in the world to see how empty it really is. And so, praise God, in January of 2000, Michael was met, studied the Bible, and became a baptized disciple. Amen, guys? As you can imagine, Michael was very fired up about being a disciple, having all of his sins forgiven. And he was super fruitful. And in one year's time, he was made the singles ministry leader there in the Portland church. Well, leave that story aside for a second. Let's go all the way back to the year 1970. And that was the year that Michelle was born in Saigon, Vietnam, or you'd call today Ho Chi Minh City. What's very interesting is that her father was a British kind of entrepreneur, businessman. And he had a lot of work in Southeast Asia. And so on one particular visit, he meets this beautiful Vietnamese woman named Kim. That's Michelle's mom. They get married. They have three kids. And he feels it's best for them to move to Perth, Australia, to raise the family. Now, Perth, you've got to understand Australia. It's about as big as the 48 states. Sydney is on the east side. Perth is on the west side. And there's absolutely nothing around it. It is the most isolated major city of the world. And that's where Michelle grew on up. And she grew up quite well. She went to private schools. The family would take amazing vacations. The father made a lot of money. But you know something? Behind that veneer of the good life, her father was sexually abusing Michelle and her sister. By her senior year, they divorced. And as a young woman in high school, she had amazing dreams. She wanted to be a doctor helping people in Africa. That was her dream. She tried to go to college. After two semesters, she flunked out. Well, trying to find a new life, she was asked by a modeling agency to move all the way over to Sydney, Australia. But even there, she was filled with more sin, and she went through three abortions. Well, then she decided, you know something, I've just got to change occupations. And so she went back to her, her hometown of Saigon or Ho Chi Minh City. And there she started working for a management company, and she met her first husband there. They quickly got married, and then he got transferred back to Portland, Oregon, because that's the world headquarters of Nike, and he worked for Nike. So they moved back to Portland, Oregon. Sadly, like most worldly marriages, it fell apart. And in one year's time, they were divorced. Well, Michelle was trying to pick up the pieces. She said, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't, don't have any money. And so she decides to go back to Portland State, where she excelled and became a high honor student, but it was also the place that she was met by disciples, and she became a baptized disciple. Amen, guys? That was in 2001. Of course, a year later, she's asked to co-lead the singles ministry. She meets that dashing young evangelist-to-be, Michael Williamson, and in 2003, they're married. Amen, guys? Now, here's the thing. They went through a lot of things there in Portland, but they got to see the birth of the new movement. In some ways, very dire circumstances brought them down to Los Angeles last year. But, you know, because of their growth in the Lord and because of their faith, and because Michelle's father is a British citizen, Michelle carries a British passport. For Americans, it's hard to work over there in England. You, you either have to get hired by an American company over there, or you, you have the money that you can uh, pay a university to be a student on over there. But Michelle, she could just walk right into London and, of course, be employed, in our case, by the church, amen. And her husband could just kind of ride along on her coattails right there, amen. 
But all of this is planned by God. And so that's why the Holy Spirit has targeted them to take out the London Mission team next summer. Let me tell you something. God is sovereign over the nations. But God is also sovereign in your life. And he has a plan for your life. But you have to be surrendered to God's purposes and timing. Amen? Amen. Point two. Surrender to God's blessings of righteousness. Turn to Psalm 18. Psalm 18 is, uh, I think it's Matt Sullivan's favorite scripture. And in verse 20, we read a very challenging concept that David shares about. He says, The Lord has dealt with me according to my righteousness. According to the cleanliness of my hands, he has rewarded me. Verse 24. The Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. Wow. Right here, two different times, David says, God has dealt with me according to my righteousness. That is a principle of God. And sometimes as Christians, we just don't get it. Why isn't God blessing us? Well, a lot of time, it's because we've not been the righteous vessels that God can use. And David even prays, God bless me according to my righteousness. You know, at the conference, we talked about the fact that the preacher and his preaching is the spiritual ceiling for a congregation. But applying it in a congregational level, we need to understand that a Bible talk leader, his life and his teaching is the spiritual ceiling for a Bible talk. Or the same holds true for a regional leader. That his life and his preaching is the spiritual ceiling for the region. You know, I I don't know about you, but I was so encouraged by all the disciples that came to visit. But perhaps as encouraging as, as any disciples were Chris and Carrie Sue Adams from Syracuse, New York. It was very encouraging because I'd just been out there earlier in July because they'd gone through a real tough time. Now, the church in Syracuse is not a real big church. It's about 60 disciples. But they'd sent out from that church in the last two years two significant mission teams, Chicago and D.C. That's pretty awesome, guys. Amen? And when you send out mission teams, it hits you. It tears up a lot of relationships. It, it, it's really tough on, the, on, on all the brothers and sisters that have to stay here, so to speak. And so from January to July... They'd only had one baptism, and they were hurting. They'd asked me and some others to come on out there, and I I just laid out the scriptures. I laid out this principle here in Psalm 18 that God deals with us according to our righteousness. And after talking to Chris and Carrie Sue, I saw, wow, yes, you've done great things for God, but your faith is so hurting you need to look over here in Revelation chapter 2. And so we went to Revelation chapter 2 where the Bible says, and Jesus is saying specifically, he says, you have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you've fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. And I explained to Chris, I said, a lot of people misquote this scripture. They say, well, uh, you know, I've lost my first love. Now, loss seems like it's incidental. It's an accident. It doesn't happen. It's kind of like the brother called me uh, a day or so ago. He says, oh, bro, I fell into sin. No, bro, you decided to sin. You didn't fall into sin. You decided to sin. Fall into sin is like accident. Oh, oops. No, you didn't oops it. You decided you wanted that sin more than God. That's right. You didn't fall in there any more than someone lost their first love. You forsake it. And so I called the church, and in particular, Chris and Carrie Sue, to repent. It was was awesome. Right after the lesson, Chris is just very moved by his own shortcoming and his own sin. He gets up there, publicly apologizes for his sin, and then calls the entire church to repent. And the next three weeks, God gave them five baptisms. Is that awesome? And one of the baptisms was Chris and Carrie Sue's daughter. See, God blesses us according to our righteousness. But you know, one of the great challenges of righteousness 
is loving one another and keeping unity. Turn to Genesis chapter 11. This is an incredible account right here. You may know it as the story of the Tower of Babel. Chapter 11, verse 1. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. As men moved eastward, they found a plain in Sinar and settled there. They said to each other, come, let's make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Then they said, come, let us build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. The Lord said, if it's one people speaking the same language they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. Come, let's go down and confuse their language so they'll not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there all over the earth, and they stopped building the city. That's why it's called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. From there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Now, we understand from Genesis 1 forward, God had commanded mankind to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Well, these guys were just rebellious. But in their rebellion, they had a dream. They dreamed of building a tower that would reach to the heavens. And the Bible says right here that the Lord was concerned about this because he says in verse 6, if as one people speak in the same language, they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan to do will be impossible for them. These are pagan guys. And when they were totally unified, nothing was impossible. That's the way that God made mankind. Is that, is that awesome? That pagans can do the impossible. What about disciples? Well, now we understand the call of Jesus. John 13, 34 and 35 says, Jesus says, you know, by this all men will know you're my disciples by your love one for another. And he goes, he says, you must love one another. See, if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, then you must love your brothers and sisters. And not just, quote, love them, but like them. Turn to Matthew chapter 18. As we go through this, I just want to ask you a question. Is there a disciple you just don't like? Is there a disciple that grates you? I mean, you you talk about the kind of grating. You know how someone takes their fingernails and goes on a chalkboard? And the moment you see this person, the moment they speak to you, it's just like... It just hardens your heart. Verse 15 of chapter 18 says, If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault, just the two of you. If he listens to you, you've won your brother over. But if you'll not listen, take one or two others along, so that every matter will be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, treat him as you would a pagan or a tax collector. This is Jesus' steps of discipline. He says, man, if someone has sinned against you, you go to them. See, a lot of times when people sin against us, we feel like, I'm just waiting for them to come to me. They're such wicked sinners, they should know that. You know, a lot of times, people are deceived by their sin. And so the Lord has a way to fix it up. Anybody that's been sinned against, you know you've been sinned against. Why? Because you're hurt and you're getting bitter. And he says, okay, if you're hurt and you're getting bitter, you need to go to that person, just you and that person, because if you can talk to them and let them know, and then they can apologize, well, then you've won your brother over. Is it any surprise then? This is a couple verses later, verse 21 says, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. See, reconciliation, yes, has to have initiation, But there's got to have to be forgiveness. There's going to have to be forgiveness. And of course, the whole next account is the story of the unmerciful servant who was forgiven of a huge debt, 
but refused to forgive a minor debt by another servant. And of course, the parallel is we've been given, forgiven a huge debt of all the sins in our life. We need to forgive one another of the sins that we have committed. Are you with me right here, guys? You know, it occurs to me that sometimes we just write it off, ah, oh, we just have a personality conflict. Nah, I just don't like his leadership style. Sounds like you got some strong feelings, bro. Sis, that's some wickedness in your heart. Now, no one's, no one's saying that leadership is perfect. Let you in on, on a secret. All leaders are sinners. And you know what sinners do best? That's exactly right. You got it. If you're expecting your Bible talk leader to be perfect, man, you're in the wrong church. There's no perfect church. But there's a church that can be perfect in Christ when we extend love and forgiveness to one another. That's not the white war sin. Sin must be apologized and confessed, whether it be by the youngest Christian or by the strongest leader. Sin must be dealt with. But don't let it steal your faith that someone hurts your feelings. Go fix it up. Go win that brother over. Go win that sister over, and God will bless us. You know, the last Sunday had so many awesome blessings. But for, for us in the West region, it was, it was a powerful time uh, because uh, Miriam, Roland's sister, got baptized. Amen. And uh, then, uh, miracle of miracles, Manny got baptized. Victor's brother. And we'll talk a little bit more about Manny later, but <laughs> to, remember when Moses went to the Red Sea, it was, the baptism was about that level, you know, it was, it was an amazing time. But not only were they added to the efforts of the West brothers and sisters, but also the Fentons were restored. That was awesome. And so the, the Lord blessed us with an increase of four. And the Bible says, remember this in Acts chapter two, and the Lord added to their number. See, when someone gets baptized, we're not the one adding. It's the Lord added to their number. When someone gets restored, they come back to God, and the Lord added to their number. When someone places membership, the Holy Spirit's brought them from afar, and the Lord added to their number. Are you with me right here, guys? And so I was just kind of wondering, what, well, you know, that, that, was, that was a great victory. So I went back and looked at the statistics, and we understand statistics don't tell the whole story, but you can't blow them off either. They say something. And so I looked at the West region as of January 1 this year, and we had 22 disciples. And I said, well, okay, what happened? Because I know we had a lot of turmoil, a lot of disunity in February. And so February 1st, we were at 21. Wow. Lord, bless us according to our righteousness. There was so much disunity in the region. I, I told Lance, I says, babe, you know, we're busy, but I think it's time we stepped in and started to lead the West and call people to love one another. This is not an optional thing. We got to love one another and we got to like one another. And you know, in the past six months, and it's totally the Lord, we've gone from 21 as of February 1st to 42 disciples now in the West, just six months later. See, that's God. Now I've got to ask you a question. How's the Lord working in your Bible talk? How's the Lord working in your region? Maybe it just comes down to simply you don't love one another enough. When people see a loving Bible talk, when people see a loving region, they just want to be a part of it. The world is such, such a, a place of rejection and hurt and pain. They want to come to a place where they're loved for who they are. Are you with me right here, church? See, we need to get a conviction, guys. The impossible can be done. But one of the requirements is unity. We need to surrender to God's blessings of righteousness. Point three. We need to surrender to God for awesome fruit. Turn to Mark chapter 9. This is a great passage. I think a particularly good passage for all of us. As of... At the beginning of chapter 9, it starts out with the account of the transfiguration. Remember that? When Peter, James, and John went up on the mountain with Jesus. 
And then on top of the mountain, there appeared Moses and Elijah representing uh, the law and the prophets. And then Jesus becomes like white as lightning. And then Moses and Elijah fade away, representing the fact that the law and the prophets has fade away. And now Jesus is everything for God. What, what an occasion that would have been, amen? Well, they had that mountaintop experience, and then they came back down to the other disciples. Now, look at what would happen when they came down off this mountaintop, because we were certainly on the mountaintop at the Global Leadership Conference. Amen, guys? Well, let's look what happened when they come down. Verse 14. When they came to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them. Well, that sounds good, doesn't it? And the teachers of the law argue with them. Well, that doesn't sound good. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that's robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. Oh, unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground, rolled around, foaming in his mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It's often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can't, said Jesus, everything is possible for him who believes. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Now that's a cranking prayer right there, guys, eh? When Jesus saw the crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said. I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse, I said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand, lifted him to his feet, and he stood up. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, this kind can only come out by prayer. Wow. You know, it's very interesting, the parallel account in Matthew 17. Matthew writes about the same thing, and he says this with a little bit more detail, right after they're pulled on in. And he says in verse 19 of chapter 17 of Matthew, Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and said, Why couldn't we drive it out? He replied, Because you have so little faith. I tell you the truth. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it'll move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Wow. Question. How's your prayer life? You know, we came off that mountaintop experience. How's reentry been? How's reentry been? Many of us made decisions. I mean, it's very cool. We had an incredible campus devotional on Friday night. Now, I'm unsure about how many people were there exactly. I think about 60, but it looked like our largest devotional ever. And Raul had asked us to write down the names of all the people that, that shared, and so I did that. And so there were 21 people that shared that night. And we're supposed to pray for those people because everyone that was sharing was sharing what they got out of the conference and what decisions they had made to change. And it was kind of interesting. The ones I, 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 I remember, I remember uh, Ashley Woody says, I want to be a woman of order and of discipline. I said, that's, that'd be awesome for the whole AMS. That's awesome. That's a great one. Okay. <laughs> Victoria says, I, I no longer want to seek the praise of men. I just want to be an unworthy servant. Well, that would be great for all the young guys that are so ambitious to get into leadership. And then Krista, she said, man, it, the, the, the whole seminar was just raw and real, but I saw that my sin was faithlessness. Christina said, yep, I've been a coward, deceitful. Steve Marich, she says, I, I just stopped sharing my faith. I'd come home after work, get some food, turn on the TV, and just veg out. Then Linda, Linda Moreno said, it's very powerful. She says, well, you know, Casey shared the story of Esther. And we remember in Esther 4 where Mordecai was challenging Esther, say, who knows that you haven't come into the kingdom for such a time as this? And a lot of us sometimes even kind of raise our eyebrows a little bit at the whole account of Esther because it's the story of a beauty queen 
who becomes queen. And yet, God uses everything for his purposes. And Linda says, you know, I'm starting to figure it out. That all the pain that I went through in the ministry, all the pain of Santiago, though it drove me almost to, to a point of a, a, a nervous breakdown, I now see that God had me go through all those things for such a time as this. Not too unlike all that Michelle went through, the sexual abuse. Well, now that she's come through it, she can help other women. Forgiving herself of the abortions? There are a lot of women that have done that. An equal number of guys that have forced it. Having a marriage that ended in divorce? I mean, for a lot of people, that's the end of my life. And so Michelle represents the fact that we can be a totally new creation with incredible dreams for God, no matter how much we've seemingly messed up our lives. Now, Linda came from it from being in the ministry and trying to be righteous. But now she saw that the sins against her, where she fell short, all these things were for such a time as this. Dom just shared, says, well, I just want to convert opinion leaders over there at UCLA. Amen? Turn with me, please, to Revelation chapter 21. Right. <clears throat> I mean, those are some great decisions, are they not? In Revelation 21... The Spirit is speaking to disciples in verse 8. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Now that's a hardline teaching. Amen? You know, a lot of times we, we kind of order sins and say, oh, this is a real bad sin. This is a medium bad sin. This one's, well, it's, it's not, it's not it's, no sin is good, but that's not real bad. It's kind of interesting. You know, if you had a brother in your Bible talk that had a problem with murdering people, you'd be concerned about where he was at spiritually, would you not? So this brother is struggling right here. You wouldn't just sit back and go, oh, well, I'm sure it'll work itself out. Well, murder's on this list. If a, you had a sister that was sexually immoral in your Bible talk, would you just let her go on her way? You say, well, well, I'm sure it'll just work itself out. Someone was practicing magic arts, going to, to tarot card places, getting the Ouija board out, reading the horoscope every day. You wouldn't, you wouldn't just let that slide. Or the idolatrous, or someone was lying all the time. See, we have, we, we have deep convictions. Someone in our Bible talk is a murderer, sexually immoral, practicing magic arts, an idolater, or a liar. They need to be dealt with. And then the vile. That just sounds bad. Have you, have you committed vileness lately? You know, someone's vile. You've got to deal with vileness. But notice what the first two sins are that will send a disciple to hell. The cowardly and the unbelieving. But a lot of times, we let brothers and sisters be cowardly. We say nothing. They may be unbelieving, as many of these brothers and sisters stepped up and apologized for, and I praise God for that. But we don't deal with it. A lot of times we have disciples who haven't brought a visitor for weeks, months. And we say nothing to them. That's not love. That's a lack of love. Something's wrong on the inside. Now, if someone isn't effective, we need to go and help them. We need to walk with them and overcome their timidity. It's not a time for rebuke. It's a time to encourage them to be what they need to be. But we've got to deal with it. I really want to talk to church right here. Where are you at? In the areas of cowardliness and unbelief. Because in many of our Bible talks, we've not had a lot of baptisms. And it's a problem. Choose what it is. Is it, is it cowardliness? Is it unbelief? Laziness? Pick your sin. But it's time to confess it. 
And we need to get a conviction as leaders that we've got to certainly set the pace here, but we've got to challenge people, yes, when they're murdering people, yes, when they're immoral, but if they're cowardly or unbelieving, this has got to be dealt with. Are you with me right here? See, fundamentally, we've got to believe that anyone can change. See, that's, that's, what, that's the only way to have awesome fruit. It's for someone to believe that someone can change. I mean, at the devotional, Joey brought up the uh, passage of uh, Acts 2, 17. It talks about your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. Some people say, well, can you teach an old dog new tricks? Well, I don't know about dogs because people aren't dogs. Amen, guys? But let me tell you something. Old guys can change. That's the kingdom. Old guys can dream dreams. I mean, it's pretty amazing uh, Ken had asked me for a, a follow-up contact that I'd gotten off Facebook. And then uh, I, I gave it to him. I said, I don't have the number. You'd have to get on Facebook. He says, well, I'm not on Facebook. A miracle happened this morning. Ken got on Facebook. <laughs> See, an old dog can learn new tricks. People can change. And you get to the point where you don't think people can change, you're going to become a very cynical and critical person. And you are not going to be proactive as a disciple of Jesus Christ, helping to disciple people in love. Because sometimes people have lost their faith and they don't think they can change. That's when you need to come in with the Word of God. That's when you need to come in with your faith and share your faith so they too can believe that they can change. Are you with me here? Last point, surrender to God for your future. John chapter 3. So everybody can now Facebook can. In John 3 verse 1. We know this passage, guys. We study with every person we meet this account about Nicodemus. Now, there's a man of the Pharisees in Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher who's come from God, for no one can perform miraculous signs you were doing if God weren't with him. Jesus, you are flat awesome. What's Jesus say? I tell you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. How can a man be born when he's old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he can't enter a second time in his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. You know, we're, we're very hard line about verses 1 through 7, and rightfully so. It's absolutely essential that we believe that you got to be born again, born of the water and the Spirit to enter the kingdom of God. See, God's Spirit can change anyone. And His Spirit works through the Word of God to affect non-Christians. You know, I was kidding a little bit earlier about Manny, but he he was a tremendous hope for for many of us that, that have children that are not faithful to God. Because Manny really got out there. I remember him coming to Portland just announcing, I don't want to be a Christian anymore. I don't want to be a follower anymore. He not just left God and got into all sorts of wickedness. His faith came to a point that he no longer believed in the Bible, no longer believed in Jesus, no longer believed in God himself. That's pretty far out there, I think. But through the persistence, particularly of Vic Jr. and a lot of other people, their example, slowly the Word of God and the Spirit started reeling him on in. And so last Sunday, you saw a miracle. Manny Gonzalez was baptized in the Christ. Amen? That's a powerful, powerful testimony. He was truly born again. But you know, in the midst of being hard and about being born again, sometimes we kind of Skim through verse 8. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you can't tell where it comes from, where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. 
The wind and the spirit in Greek are the same word, and so there's a little bit of a play on words right here. But the teaching is clear. You know, the wind, you don't know where it came from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Everybody that's a baptized disciple, you don't know where you're going because God is going to send you someplace. You know, I was so excited about the reception that uh, I felt with everybody about the Crown of Thorns project. I mean, we, we laid out, for those that weren't there on Sunday night, we laid out a more specific plan as far as evangelizing the world. And we call it the Crown of Thorns Project because you kind of picture the globe and then a crown of thorns around it representing salvation. But the whole idea is that we're going to get to cities, all the key cities around the globe. And starting in the United States, I mean, if you pick out four cities that you want to have cranking churches in to evangelize the United States, you would say New York, L.A., Chicago, and D.C., you know something? We're there with cranky discipling churches. That doesn't count the other awesome churches in places like Syracuse and Portland and Phoenix and Hilo and Hawaii. Eugene. But we're saying these pillar churches, wow, that's, that's huge for not even being three years into the new movement. And then when you think about going around the world, I mean, it's amazing what's going on. I mean, Good gravy. Michael and Michelle are going to be going to London in less than a year. Is that awesome? And there's already a remnant group of 30 waiting for them. Well, then the Kurdans are going to come back here. They're going to be training for a year or two, and they will go to Paris. They're already fluent in French. And Johannesburg, the Smellies are coming here in January, and in a year and a half, they'll go to Johannesburg, South Africa. Of course, the Sullivan's are already in Santiago, and so that means Mexico City with the Gonzalez's and Sao Paulo with the Marinos, maybe with the stop in Miami, I don't know. That's going to be easy, amen, guys? Then in Sydney, the Willis's have decided to move here and sell their house so they can pay a year's worth of salary so they can train here. Is that awesome? Now that's someone that believes. They're moving the two twin kids, 12 years old, here. Because they know that it's all about the kingdom. I mean, India, we got Raja. He's doing great. Manila, the Bartholomews will be awesome. I mean, after all, Jonah's Filipina. Amen, guys? And then, of course, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of thinking that maybe Cairo would be a great place to put Mike Patterson. <laughs> and then it's kind of a no-brainer. We think Sasha and Louisa back to Moscow, Russia. Amen, guys? And already, a little remnant group, Sasha says there are already nine people that want to get restored, and two are waiting to get baptized when they get back. And they leave this Thursday, and Lord willing, going to be back September 1st to be with us for two years. Amen. And then China could be evangelized from Hong Kong. We think DJ and Casey would be awesome to be able to go there. Because we feel like if we get to these key cities, they unlock all the other nations around them. But you know, people like the Commerce I mean, they love New York City. But when the challenge came, hey, are you willing to go? Amen. Amen. It's kind of funny because uh, Chris Broom had just gotten into a conversation with DJ and Casey. And he said, now, what would be the place you would least like to go? She said, I don't want to go anywhere in Asia. So a couple days later, I'm sitting down at the conference room. Do you know where I think would be really awesome for you guys? Hong Kong. Whenever you say you don't want to go someplace, just mark it up. That's probably where you're going to be going. Now, of course, what was really awesome is that our brother Jake Ramsier is heading off to Honolulu. And uh, there are tougher places to go. <laughs> but, you know, I appreciate this young man's heart. He'd gone through the conference. Vic Jr., Sat down with him Wednesday night. He said, bro, Kyle's hurting. As Mike Underhill went to be with DJ to give him a friend, we need you to be with Kyle so he can have a friend to be strong. That very night, he goes, I'm there. How about it? If you're asked to go someplace are you there? Well, maybe if it's Honolulu. How about Cairo? <laughs> you know, it's been an interesting weekend. 
Yesterday, Saturday, August 8th, was Elena's 36th spiritual birthday. <clears throat> I got her some roses, a little card, you know, and tried to encourage her in the Lord and everything. And uh, then it was kind of interesting. Uh, I, I was on, on, on Facebook. Ken still wasn't there yet, but I was on Facebook. <laughs> and this little thing popped up. Jeremy Cherimella's birthday. And I go, I didn't know about it. Nobody told me. So I called him on up in the afternoon. I said, bro, is, is this your birthday day? Yeah, bro. I said, well, what, what number is your birthday? Well, this birthday is my 36th birthday. I said, you're kidding. You were born on August 8th, 1973? He goes, exactly. I said, that's the same day Elena was baptized. You're as young as Elena is old in the Lord. And you know, the thing that I appreciate about Elena, I mean, 36 years in the Lord, and she is surrendered to God for her future. First of all, she married me. That was tough. But the Holy Spirit, I mean, the Holy Spirit sent us to minister in Boston. We lived in Manila, in Moscow. And yes, we lived in Cairo and preached the word there. And every time, Elena was willing to go. Because she believed that God was not just calling me, but calling her. As a matter of fact, the toughest spot that I think she was asked to go by the Spirit was back here to Los Angeles. Because she, she loved Portland. All the greenery, all the roses, all the fresh air, a lack of conflict. <laughs> but you see, she was surrendered to God for her future. And because she was willing to come, that allowed me to come and plant the church. And many of you owe your salvation to people just like that, who love God more than their comfort. But what's the challenge today? It's simple. Surrender to God's purposes and timing, P. Number two, surrender to God's blessings of righteousness, R. Number three, surrender to God for awesome fruit, A. And number four, surrender to God for your future, Y. Pray. Pray believing. Because when you have the faith of even a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move because nothing is impossible with God. Thank you.